Welcome back to Public Speaking at Rose State College, everyone. Today we're going to be discussing Chapter 3 of your course textbook on listening and criticism. Just to review some of the most important aspects of your course materials, listening comes in stages, with the most important or preeminent being active listening. We're going to define and describe the stages of listening in a series of no fewer than five stages or phases. The first being passivity. This is when you are present and are hearing something. In effect, sound waves are bouncing off your eardrums, but you're not actually responding in any appreciable way. So for example, if you've ever heard someone say, what's going on, sorry, I was replying to something on my phone. My friend just sent, have you seen the shaggy thing? then that's an example of passivity. The second phase or stage is called response. This is where you are able to respond to what was said, but you don't necessarily understand or comprehend its meaning or especially main point. Sometimes response can be a matter of listening too carefully or concentrating too hard on listening instead of attempting to respond to the thrust or the key points that a person is trying to share, especially in a public speaking setting. Ideally, one wants to accede at least to a level of selection whenever you listen. For example, if you've ever heard someone say, all I heard was test on Friday, I'm going to be shotgunning Adderall Thursday night, all I gotta say, then you at least know that that person was carefully curating what they were hearing so that they could appropriately respond in kind at a later point. Ideally, whenever you select information, you want to choose the information that's most pertinent to you or is going to have the most immediate effect on your behavior. However, it's better still to accede to a stage of listening called attention. Attention, as an example, there seemed to be a priority placed on following safety code this morning, as anything happened in the warehouse lately, is a way of distilling or synthesizing all of the information from a message, whether it's an interpersonal conversation, a public speaking setting, or even electronically mediated communication, so that you can get the quote-unquote big picture of a message. And finally, action or active listening is listening for the purposes of responding through behavior and giving someone your full and undivided attention, both physically and mentally, so that you can respond in the most appropriate way. Listening is a commodity in interpersonal communication and public speaking. So with that in mind, we're going to watch a brief presentation by Julian Treasure. In our louder and louder world, Treasure says, Sound expert Julian Treasure opines we are losing our listening. So in this short talk, Treasure is going to share five ways to retune your ears for conscious listening to other people and the world around you. Our listening. We spend roughly 60% of our communication time listening, but we're not very good at it. We retain just 25% of what we hear. Now, not you, not this talk, but that is generally true. Let's define listening as making meaning from sound. It's a mental process, and it's a process of extraction. We use some pretty cool techniques to do this. One of them is pattern recognition. So in a cultural party like this, if I say, David, Sarah, pay attention, some of you just sat up. We recognize patterns to distinguish noise from signal, and especially our name. Differencing is another technique we use. If I left this pink noise on for more than a couple of minutes, you would literally cease to hear it. We listen to differences, we discount sounds that remain the same. And, and then, then there is a whole range of filters. filters. These, These filters, filters take, take us from all sound down to what we pay attention to. Most people are entirely unconscious of these filters, but they actually create our reality in a way because they tell us what we're paying attention to right now, 
I'll give you one, one example, example of that. Intention is very important in sound, in listening. listening. When, when I married, married my wife, I promised her that I would listen to her every day as if for the first time. Now, now that's something I fall short of on a daily basis. <laughs> but, but it's a great intention, intention to have in a relationship. But, but that's, that's not all. Sound, sound places us in space and in time. If you close your eyes right now in this room, you're aware of the size of the room from the reverberation and the bouncing of the, the sound of the surfaces. And you're aware of how many people are around you because of the, the micro noises you're receiving. And sound places us in time as well because sound always has time embedded in it. In fact, I would suggest that our listening is the main way that we experience the flow of time from past to future. So, sonority is time meaning a great quote. I said at the beginning we're losing our listening. Why did I say that? Well, there are a lot of reasons for this. First of all, we invented ways of recording. First, writing, then audio recording, and now video recording as well. The premium on accurate and careful listening has simply disappeared. Secondly, the world is now so noisy, we're just cacophony going on visually and auditorily. It's just hard to listen, it's tiring to listen. Many people take refuge in headphones, but they turn big public spaces like this, shared soundscapes, into millions of tiny little personal sound bubbles. In this scenario, nobody's listening to anybody. We're becoming impatient. We don't want oratory anymore, we want sound bites. And the art of conversation is being replaced dangerously, I think, by personal broadcasting. I don't know how much listening there is in this conversation, which is sadly very common, especially in the UK. We're becoming desensitized. Our media have to scream at us with these kind of headlines in order to get our attention. And that means it's harder for us to pay attention to the quiet, the subtle, the understated. This is a serious problem that we're losing our listening. This is not trivial. Because listening is our access to understanding. Conscious listening always creates understanding. And only without conscious listening can these things happen. A world where we don't listen to each other at all is a very scary place indeed. So I'd like to share with you five simple exercises, tools you can take away with you to improve your own conscious listening. Would you like that? Good. The first one is silence. Just three minutes a day of silence is a wonderful exercise to reset your ears and to recalibrate so that you can hear the quiet again. If you can't get absolute silence, Go for quiet, that's, that's absolutely, absolutely fine. fine. Second, I call this the mixer. So if, even if you're, you're in a noisy environment, environment like this, and we all spend a lot of time in places, places like, like this, listen in, in the coffee bar, bar to how, how many channels of sound can I hear? How many individual, individual channels in that mix am I listening to? And you can do it in a beautiful place as well, like a lake. How many birds am I hearing? Where are they? Where are those ripples? It's a great exercise for improving the quality of your listening. Third, this exercise, exercise I call savouring, savouring. And, and this is a beautiful, beautiful exercise. exercise, it's about enjoying mundane sounds. This, for example, is my tumble dryer. It's, it's a waltz. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I, love I love it. Or just try, try this one for size. So mundane, mundane sounds, sounds can be really interesting if you pay attention. I call that the hidden choir. It's, it's around us all the time. The next, next exercise is probably the most important of all of these. If you just take one thing away, this is listening positions. The idea that you can move your listening position to what's appropriate to what you're listening to. This is playing with those filters. Remember I gave you those filters at the beginning? It's starting to play with them as levers to get conscious about them and to move to different places. These are just some of the listening positions or scales of listening positions that you can use. There are many. Have fun with that. It's very exciting. And finally, an acronym. You can use this in listening in communication. If you're in any one of those roles, and I think that probably is everybody who's listening to this talk. The acronym is RASA which is the Sanskrit word for juice or essence. And rasa stands for receive, which means pay attention to the person, appreciate, making little noises like, hmm, oh, okay, 
Summarise the word so is very important in communication and ask, ask questions afterwards. Now, sound is my passion, it's my life, I wrote a whole book about it, so I live to listen. That's too much to ask for most people. But I believe that every human being needs to listen consciously in order to live fully. Connected in space and in time to the physical world around us, connected in understanding to each other. Not, Not to mention spiritually connected, because every, every spiritual path I know of has listening and contemplation at its heart. That's why we need to teach listening in our schools as a skill. Why is it not taught? It's crazy. And if we can teach listening in our schools, we can take our listening off that slippery slope to that dangerous, scary world that I talked about and move it to a place where everybody is consciously listening all the time, or at least capable of doing it. Now, now, I, I don't, don't know how to, to do that, that but this is TED. And, and I, I think, think the TED community is capable of anything. So, so I invite you to connect with me, connect with each other, take, take this mission out, and let's get listening taught in schools and transform the world in one generation to a conscious listening world, a world of connection, a world of understanding, and a world of peace. Thank you for listening to me today. All right. Just as an example, let's look at a few visual images and determine how well listening is occurring. You can tell right away that what we have here is empathic, probably even critical listening, as outlined by your course textbook. Notice that both individuals are on the same plane. They're making eye contact with one another, and they're being responsive to each other's body posture in a mirroring exercise. Compare that to this. We can tell right away that listening isn't happening by either participant in this sequence or communication setting. Not only do we have extremely uneven levels, they're not making eye contact with one another, and we can tell that each is absorbed in their own intellectual and perhaps emotional sphere. Which conversation would you prefer to be in? I think the answer is obvious, and so it's obvious why listening is so absolutely important, not only for our daily interpersonal communication, but also whenever we have problems to overcome within our relationships. One thing that Treasure mentions quite frequently is summarizing and asking. In our daily speech, we often conflate feedback and criticism. But summarizing and asking is, according to Treasure, a form of feedback, which we'll define as the verification of a message or behavior through observant response. In other words, feedback is merely taking time during a communication setting to share with a person that you understood what they were saying and perhaps even what they were feeling when they shared that information. This is distinct from criticism. Constructive criticism is offering valid, sensitive observations for the improvement, development, and sophistication of a specific message or behavior. So in other words, criticism focuses on behavior, not a person. It's not constructive communication or criticism, and it's certainly not constructive listening, to only hear a person so that you can tell them that they are inferior in some way. However, concentrating on someone's message or behavior makes it a shared problem that has to be overcome, overcome together, which creates a more cooperative communication environment. Let's discuss that a little bit. Whenever we use listening and appropriate criticism, we have the intention of education and instruction. We focus on behavior rather than the person and then we develop and refine our existing performance or communication. So constructive criticism could, should contain thoughtful, sensitive, and calculated observations, because it has the purpose of assisting a performer or a communicator and their presentation in a public speaking setting, and a regular person or a person from our everyday life in an interpersonal setting. Let's look at some examples of that. I'm going to read out some forms of criticism, and you decide whether or not they are appropriate or inappropriate. The thing was just really, really bad. You need to do more. Well, right away we can tell that this is inappropriate criticism, because it's not sensitive, 
and it's not essentially understanding. We're not sharing vital information about how the person can do more. We haven't even defined what that word means in the context of our observation. Let's look at the second one. I saw that both reports listed consumer confidence first, which made me think it was the most important thing in the quarter. Notice how the person has already acceded to a level of not just responsive and selected listening, but they've acceded to a level of understanding that demonstrates attention. They're synthesizing the information, summarizing it. So they're using feedback in their criticism. Third one. I wish there was a way the last main point could use stronger evidence to emphasize how much the ballot measure is hurting local wildlife. Again, this would be an appropriate criticism, because notice they're not saying that the speaker is bad, they're concentrating on an aspect of the speech, which means collaboratively, both the person offering criticism and the speaker can work together to solve this problem. Finally, can you do it more like me? I would say it like this, because I learned in my last class how important it is to slow down and say it's sad when you need to get someone's attention. Well, first of all, I don't even know what they're referring to in this piece of criticism. Second of all, it's very difficult to mimic another person's delivery. It would be more appropriate to concentrate on an outcome that you wanted and then work together with the speaker in order to achieve that outcome in a way that they could accede to. So, how do you then receive criticism? It's important to listen when you're receiving criticism as much as you're about to give it. Number one is practice empathy, and your course textbook talks at length about empathic listening. So place yourself in the role of the critic. Listen actively and practice feedback. Use the RASA formula that Julian Treasure spoke, spoke about, especially summarizing and asking questions. Paraphrase your critic's core observations. Put them in your own words so that they'll become more mnemonic or memorable and summarize the entire criticism during the conclusion of the critic's observations. Whenever you ask questions, ask questions to increase understanding, or highlight key points or observations, and then try to use I think messages to communicate your response. For example, if someone says, I don't think or I don't believe that your second main point is interesting enough, you might use a counterphrase such as, I think you want more evidence, or I think you want a more interesting or provocative anecdote in that moment. Is that correct? Finally, express appreciation in a sincere and candid way. Even if the criticism hurts, understand by practicing empathy that it can be very difficult to offer that kind of criticism, and you want people to be honest with you even if it hurts them and yourself for the sake of improvement. Let's look at this and see if we're seeing a valid criticism and also valid responses to criticism. Person 1. So is it true you're leaving Ridgecrest? I'm sorry, Beth. It's been a tough decision. You're breaking Mom's heart. And one thing that's been a long time coming, I'm sorry about Mom, but I, we're praying for you. Figure some things out. So, as you can tell, this is an appropriate criticism. Notice how the person in blue isn't even listening or waiting for a response or synthesis from the other person. They are immediately jumping upon and seizing upon what they want to say. This is a clear evidence of the absence of listening even in an electronically mediated communication, which means that feedback and especially constructive criticism are not going to be a possibility in this communication setting. So what are some appropriate ways to offer criticism that can make it more amenable to interpersonal communication settings. Well, the first is called sandwich criticism. Sandwich criticism begins by complementing a person's existing work, which makes this especially valuable in public speaking settings. You relax the performer by doing this and then develop trust. You talk about what you saw in their presentation that made their presentation or speech effective. You then reduce the potential negative response in turn, and you encourage open-mindedness from the other person. 
Then, after that, you offer criticism and areas of concern by focusing on behavioral symptoms and problems. You ask frequent questions and causes. In other words, you try to reverse engineer what may have caused the obstructions, issues, or problems that you see in that person's presentation. And then you solicit suggestions from improvement. In other words, you brainstorm or work cooperatively with that person so that it's easier to understand how you can collaborate on improvements. If that doesn't work, you can also try something called Socratic criticism, a method that you might have heard of before. This is designed to draw criticism from the performer themselves to foster their own independence so that they can practice constructive criticism on themselves at a future date. It requires phrasing your criticism in the form of a question by concentrating on leading what are called open questions. These are questions that can't be answered with a simple yes or no statement. For example, you might say, how did you feel or what were you thinking whenever you decided to transition from main point two to main point three or what made you select that evidence to support your ideas? You then deployed closed questions at key moments. So, in other words, you didn't give much thought to your introductory quote. If you get the person to admit yes, or that's right, then you're in congruence with one another and you've identified a cause for that person's problems. This places a premium on sustained dialogue because the longer you speak with someone, the greater the bond of trust, and this provides an equitable atmosphere or an equivocal atmosphere, so a person is more familiar and thus more willing to divulge vulnerable information about their performance or behaviors. And of course, it encourages frequent feedback throughout its survey, because it prompts both people in the critical setting to constantly put things in their own words to describe what's happening and thus to take the issues or problems out of the sphere of one person's responsibility or accountability. All right, folks, that's all we've got for today. Be sure to check our Canvas site so that you can know what discussion journal entry and quiz to complete. Feel free to reach out to me via email if you have any questions, and take care.